Hi, everybody. I see everybody starting to join. We're just going to give everybody a few more minutes or a few more seconds here before we get started so uh, our participants can all log in and get situated. All right, it's 12.30, let's, uh, let's get going. Uh, my name's Adam Selkowitz, I'm the chairman of Lupus LA, and I wanna welcome everybody today to our latest on Lupus Patient Conference, our first ever vir um, virtual patient conference. Um, so we thank all of you for joining. There's over 200 of you registered today, uh, and we're really excited to, to welcome you here. Uh, we've got some great speakers today to talk to you about a variety of issues. Uh, and we're gonna do our best to answer as many questions as possible today. Um, but I promise you this, anything you don't get answered today, uh, Catherine's gonna be shooting out a questionnaire uh, via email right after the webinar. And there'll be a, a few questions to answer. And then if you have a question that wasn't answered, we ask that you just fill out that questionnaire and send it in. And we will be sure to get back to you with your, um, with your answer to your question. Um, you know, this is obviously a challenging time, uh, especially for people with autoimmune conditions. And Lupus LA is obviously very sensitive to that. Um, we've really done our best to, um, I, you know, change our entire game plan. Uh, the minute we all went virtual, uh, we moved all of our support groups online. So now we have weekly online support groups that um, the schedule is available on our website. Um, and we're doing things like this latest on Lupus Patient Conference. Uh, we've been doing some Facebook chats and I'm sure many of you have seen some of those Facebook chats. Um, and honestly, one of the advantages uh, of this situation is that we've really been able to be more global. Uh, and we have people from all over the world now interested in learning more about lupus. Um, and I think there's so much crossover between COVID and lupus and a lot of the medicines and the, um, and the testing and the, the vaccines that uh, there's a lot of interest in the autoimmune world right now. And, um, you know, our goal is to really uh, shine a light on lupus and other autoimmune illnesses as best we can and, uh, and really to educate lupus patients and their families. So uh, we've got lots of information on our website, lupusla.org. Uh, and if you have any other questions about Lupus LA, uh, Catherine is going to put her email in the chat. Uh, and you can email Catherine and um, she'll direct you to the appropriate person at Lupus LA. So uh, first I wanna thank our sponsors for today, um, Pharma, Mallinckrodt Pharmaceuticals and GSK. Um, they have been all so supportive of the work we've done with lupus patients and we really appreciate all their effort and support, you know, standing behind us through thick and thin. So uh, it means a lot to us. And I wanna thank our speakers today, and I'm gonna introduce uh, the first one right now. Uh, Dr. Sheetal Desai is a rheumatologist at the University of California, Irvine. Um, her areas of interest are lupus and antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. And she's the director of the Lupus Clinic and the UC Irvine Rheumatology Fellowship Program. And she's the chief of rheumatology at UC Irvine. So anything rheumatological at UC Irvine is really just, it's her job. Um, and we're really excited. She's also a wonderful member of our Lupus LA Medical Advisory Board. And I'm going to turn it over to her to talk about COVID and lupus. Thank you so much, Adam. Uh, welcome, everyone. I think this is a wonderful forum that Lupus LA is doing um, so we can disseminate information. Usually about this time of the year in Orange County, we do have a Lupus LA um, in-person session, and we've done it for God, about a decade at least. And this year, I'm glad we're continuing it, although now in a virtual format. For today, I was initially going to talk on lupus in general, and then I thought, uh, and I realized that the majority of my patients have a lot of questions about COVID and how it relates to lupus. So I decided to scratch my normal lupus talks. And um, what I'll do is I'll go over the top questions patients of mine bring up as it pertains to COVID and kind of go over what I recommend to them. And then if you have additional questions, we can talk about it in the Q&A. So as you all know, unfortunately, as of today, 
we have over 4 million cases of COVID in the United States. We have more cases of COVID than any other country in the world. When it comes to uh, within the United States, California now has uh, the number one um, number of total cases of COVID. If we break that down further by county, the top counties within California that have the highest number of cases are Los Angeles County followed by both Orange County and Riverside County, and the cases are still continuing on. So I know that this is first and foremost in everyone's minds right now uh, as uh, we think about how this relates to lupus. And I'll start with the number one question I get from my patients is, if I have lupus, am I at higher risk of COVID? And many of the times this relates to the Centers for Disease Control or the CDC's kind of um, risk stratifications that they have for different patients with different conditions. And any of you guys can go on there on the internet. And if you look at the CDC risk categories, know that they are evolving. The categories we had back in early March have been expanded over the months and include more uh, categories of patients. But if you go and look at the categories, they break them up into the strongest risk profiles based on the evidence and then mixed evidence if there's an increased risk. Lupus is actually not on there, okay? So the, although we know that the immune system of our uh, patients with lupus does not function normally, and there is some aberrancies, most patients with lupus do not get infections due to lupus itself. The majority of our patients with lupus get infections if they're on medicines that actually suppress their immune system. So if you look at the traditional CDC risk category breakdowns, lupus is not on there. However, if you look at the uh, second category, which is there is mixed evidence of an elevated risk, what is on there are patients that actually take steroids or immune suppressant medications. So what I tell my patients with lupus is having lupus, lupus in and of itself does not confer a higher risk. Uh, however, if you are on medications that suppress your immune system that are pretty strong, then because of the immune suppression um, that actually happens, you may be at higher risk. So I just wanted to kind of uh, bring that up. And Plaquenil is not one of the medicines we feel strongly suppresses the immune system, but other medications like azathioprine or Imuran, uh, which is a trade name, methotrexate, uh, Benlista, Rituximab, Cytoxan, Celsept, these are all much stronger medications that can suppress the immune system and then theoretically increase your risk of contracting COVID. So the second question I get is, if the medications, um, not Plaquenil again, put me at higher risk of COVID, should I cut back on the medications? And this is actually a great question that all of you guys have and my patients have brought up to me. And what we actually say kind of across the board, all of our colleagues that treat patients with lupus is although the medications you're on theoretically raises your risk of contracting COVID, the benefits of being on these medications is that it controls your lupus. So, uh, the flip side is, is if patients' lupus is well controlled and then they stop the medications and then that patient ends up having a lupus flare, what that patient will need is higher doses of immunosuppressant medications and higher doses of steroids to control the lupus. So it really is a risk benefit ratio. I would highly recommend you talk to your physician if you're considering stopping the medications. And for the majority of my patients since March, I have actually not stopped their medications. I have continued the medications that the majority of my patients are on for lupus to make sure their lupus remains stable. But if you have any specific uh, questions, I would urge you to talk to your physician before stopping your medications. And what we feel very comfortable with is Plaquenil. That Plaquenil does not suppress your immune system in a significant amount. And so that is one medicine I would not want you guys to be worried about uh, holding at a time like this when it comes to COVID. 
So I would say for the most part, all of my patients uh, since the beginning of COVID, I have not stopped any of their medications and I've continued it because I do not want their lupus to flare. I do not want to have to increase their dose of steroids or add additional immunosuppressants. And I don't want them to be consumers of the healthcare system to be hospitalized at a time like this when I'm trying to prevent them from getting exposed to more patients. Um, next question I get is, will Plaquenil protect me? And uh, we're in a time where prior to 2020, most people know that no one knew anything about Plaquenil outside of lupus patients and our patients with rheumatologic conditions. Now the whole world knows about Plaquenil. Everyone knows what Plaquenil is. Initially, some of our patients had uh, some difficulty getting Plaquenil. I think I've heard that less and less. Most pharmacies, most health healthcare systems have done an amazing job in making sure patients have access to Plaquenil, especially if they have lupus. Now, early reports had come out in end of February, early March, that Plaquenil, because of its inherent antiviral properties, may actually um, help prevent COVID. As we've had additional data accumulate, we've had some conflicting data, where some data says it may help you, some data says it doesn't help you. I think, honestly, we do not know the absolute answer. And this is why uh, with science, we need sufficient data to really be able to tell how much Plaquenil helps with COVID. And so I think the real answer remains uh, to be uh, elucidated. And hopefully as we get more and more data over time, we'll have a better idea. I've been telling all my patients that it might have antiviral properties, that we know the benefits for lupus is immense. We know it does not suppress the immune system to a significant amount at all. And so I have been telling all of my lupus patients, please continue your Plaquenil at this time. Next question is, how can I tell the difference between lupus and COVID-19? And over the months I've had patients call me and say, listen, I have a rash. I don't know if this rash is lupus. You know, I have um, a, a runny nose. I don't know if this is actually lupus or if this is COVID-19. And the most important thing I tell the patients is pay attention to your symptoms and if they mirror the symptoms that you normally have with lupus. So one of my patients, when she had called me, her rash was very consistent with the rash she gets with lupus. She says she's been going outside on walks more, um, you know, during the day just to kind of help her deal with the increased stress of lupus. And at that time, I didn't want to have her come in and necessarily um, treat her or evaluate her further. Then I had another patient that actually had a rash that was completely different than her normal lupus rash. And in that setting, I had her monitor her symptoms and monitor if she had any exposures. You know, so the, the most important thing is to see if your symptoms mimic symptoms that you traditionally get with lupus. Know that not all symptoms of COVID-19 actually overlap with symptoms of lupus. The loss of sense of taste, the loss of sense of smell, the diarrhea, the sore throat, those can be very unique symptoms of COVID that most of our patients with lupus actually do not complain about. So if you get a symptom that you're concerned about that might actually overlap with that of COVID, first and foremost, I would think about, is that something that you've actually had with your lupus? Pay attention to your other symptoms and see if they actually mimic what you get with a lupus flare versus if they're different. And if you've actually been exposed to someone that has had COVID-19, please call your doctor and go over the symptoms so you and your doctor together can decide if there's something that just doesn't make sense and you need to be tested further, okay? Um, next question really is, uh, and I, you know, I will kind of go over it is, what if you are exposed to COVID-19? Kind of segueing from the last question. If you are exposed to someone with COVID-19, please reach out to your doctor. Because early in March, we didn't have a lot of availability to offer testing to everybody if they were asymptomatic. So at that time, we were telling patients to quarantine themselves, watch their symptoms, watch out for anything that they may have that makes them feel 
like they are concerned they may have COVID. Then in about the May time frame, I think our testing had picked up quite significantly in a really nice way. And we were actually bringing a lot more patients in to get tested for COVID. I would say more recently, the testing in many areas has actually hit some difficulty as we're testing so many people. And I've heard of shortages of reagents, of testing kits, of a numbers of uh, healthcare workers that can actually be there to test patients. So it's really been going up and down. And I would say that if you were exposed to someone with COVID-19, please contact your doctor. If they're able to test you in a reasonable amount of time, they may test you. If there is a shortage of testing at that time, they may tell you to monitor your symptoms, to stay put, quarantine yourself and monitor your symptoms and watch if anything were to develop. And they would help you and tell you what to do with your medications based on what you're actually taking. So I want you guys all to realize that a lot of um, these things are really kind of case by case. It's very hard for us to tell everyone across the board what to do with lupus and COVID, but I really urge you to reach out to your physician to make sure based on your case and your situation, you can figure out what the best thing is to do for you. And I'm just watching the time. It's about 1246. I'm going to do one more top question that I get is, is it safe to go back to work? As things have opened up and patients have gone back to work over the last several uh, weeks in the last month or so, and that's changing again right now as some areas as things are closing back down again. But this has been a great question that patients have brought up to me. I've actually evaluated it case by case. I've evaluated it depending on what their workplace looks like, what they do if they can maintain social distancing in their workplace, if everyone in their workplace actually wears masks. Um, and based on that, depending on what they do, I've allowed some patients to go back to work. I've actually, based on what medication some of my patients are taking, and if they're on very strong chemotherapeutic medications, have made the decision on some patients to actually not have them go back to work. So please know that the decision to go back to work depends on how you are doing with lupus, what you are taking for your lupus medication wise, and then how safe your workplace is for you to go back to work. And I would really urge you to have those conversations with your physician. And I think Adam, I might stop here just to allow for enough time for all the other panelists. And Perfect. then I'll be here at the end as well. Excellent. Yeah, we're getting some good questions in the chat and the Q&A section at the bottom there. So um, I'm going to facilitate a, a Q&A at about, uh, we hope about 15 or 20 minutes at the end. Um, but that was really helpful and super useful information. Um, so thanks for that. And uh, yes, please, you know, send us your questions in the chat or the Q&A at the bottom. And we're going to go through a lot of those um, after uh, the other speakers. And then anything we don't get answered or anything that's super specific, uh, we're going to have um, one of our experts get back to you. Uh, so next up, uh, I'm very excited to introduce Dr. Micah Yu. Uh, Dr. Yu is a rheumatologist and the chief medical officer of the Institute of Plant-Based Medicine in Newport Beach, California. Uh, he uses an integrative medicine approach and uh, is a certified in lifestyle medicine, uh, which I probably need a lot more of, but... Um, we're really excited to hear his talk, and um, he's going to talk to you a lot about how uh, his philosophy about lupus and integrative medicine and, and how that can help us, especially through uh, the COVID times. So I'll uh, turn it over to you, Dr. Yu. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Adam. Thank you, uh, Lupus LA, for having me today. I'm very honored. I'm uh, very happy to speak amongst these uh these um, wonderful individuals as well. So my name is Dr. Micah Yu. I am certified um, in the lifestyle medicine by the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Um, what I love to do as a rheumatologist is bridge the gap between lifestyle medicine and rheumatology because I feel um, that lifestyle medicine does play a role in lupus and a lot of autoimmune diseases as well. So for the lifestyle medicine, there are six factors I always go over with my patients and I'm gonna go over them with you today and how they affect lupus. So number one is nutrition. Nutrition is huge. That's gonna be one of the main focuses of my talk today. Number two is exercise. Number three is sleep. Number four is healthy relationships. 
Number five is emotional well-being. And number six is tobacco and uh, risky substance use. So let's go over uh, nutrition. I know I have about 10 minutes here, so I'll try to zoom through, but compact as much as possible. So in lupus and many autoimmune diseases, we have something called gut dysbiosis. So what that means is that the gut bugs, uh, the bacteria in our intestines are out of balance. And just to go over a little bit of science with you all, so 60 to 70% of our immune system is located um, at the gut. So whatever you're eating um, every day, it's communicating with your immune system. There's only one cell layer uh, that separates your immune system from your, uh, the lumen of the colon. So when you eat something that's inflammatory, that can cause something called a leaky gut, um, which so each cell is connected um, together tightly, but when there's a leaky gut, it opens up a little bit. So the bacteria and the little food particles can go in and communicate with their immune system. And that's what happens in lupus as well. That's what gut dysbiosis causes. And what things can we do uh, through nutrition to help this? So number one is dietary fiber. Dietary fiber is so important. Where do you get dietary fiber? You get it from fruits, from vegetables, and from whole grains. There's people that live the longest in the world. There's five places. There's one city in Japan, Okinawa. There's, um, I believe, Sicily, Italy. There's Chile and uh, Loma Linda. And there's one other city I'm um, blanking out on. But these places in the world live the longest. So it's called the blue zones. And they eat a lot of dietary fiber. So we really need to emphasize that in our diet for lupus as well. Studies have shown that with the higher, in the higher intake of dietary fiber, the lower the C-reactive protein, which is a mark of inflammation, your rheumatologist is probably getting every visit, and the lower the rate risk of metabolic syndrome and um, cholesterol and heart disease. Another important factor in nutrition that we should emphasize is phytonutrients. Phytonutrients are micronutrients that are found in fruits and vegetables and whole grains as well. And if you see the different fruits and vegetables, there's different colors in them. Each color represents a different phytonutrient. So for example, grapes have been shown to be anti-inflammatory. It contains something called resveratrol. Now, I don't recommend you go crazy on wine just because I'm giving this talk, but I do want to recommend that you try to emphasize more grapes in your diet, at least have one serving every day. That can help with inflammation. Another type of phytonutrient example is from turmeric, and the active in phytonutrient in turmeric is curcumin. So curcumin, there's over 6,000 studies in medical literature in PubMed, and that has also been found to be anti-inflammatory as well. Just another example here is cruciferous vegetables, the families. So that includes broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower. That contains something called sulforaphane. Sulforaphane um, is anti-inflammatory as well, and it can potentially decrease the risk of cancer. So those are just three examples. There's so many more examples out there. Your apples, your tomatoes, um, what else is cherries, they all contain something special. So what I tell my patients is to really eat the rainbow. Don't think about, oh, I got to get this one final nutrient in. Eat the rainbow, eat at least five servings of fruits and vegetables every day to really help calm down the inflammation in your body. Now, the other question is, what food should I not eat? Now, this really depends on each individual, but there is a general rule I would say for all patients um, is mainly to avoid processed food. Highly processed food can be very, very inflammatory. Um, some patients that I've seen in the past, they just cut up processed food and they start getting better, okay? Um, another one that I really tell my patients is to avoid excess salt. Some salt is fine, but when you go out to the restaurants, they just uh, drowning the food in salt and it could be very, very tasty, but it, could, it won't be very good for your lupus and you may potentially flare on excess salt. So really watch your salt intake. Um, other things that I would tell my patients to try to avoid is refined sugar, your um, sodas, your candies, really try to minimize the refined sugar in there. And high fat diets, um, really high fat foods, I would really emphasize you try to stay away from because studies have also shown that that also causes a gut dysbiosis 
or as I remember, as I uh, talked about earlier, an imbalance of the gut bacteria, which has been seen in lupus. And one final animal, uh, food that I would uh, say is possibly a dairy, specifically from uh, cow's milk. I would say that can be potentially um, cause um, lupus uh, to flare as well. I mean, it depends on the individual. I know a lot of my patients have say, um, told me that from dairy, when they count dairy, they do a little bit better or they do a lot better. I mean, it depends on every individual. Everyone's different, but those are the general rules I give to my patients. Now, there's a lot of um, individual um, variability about food sensitivities and s other things like that, but we're not gonna get into that here, but you, maybe you could possibly ask me in the Q&A. Another factor in lifestyle medicine I do wanna emphasize is exercise. Exercise is anti-inflammatory. Generally, you should be getting about 150 minutes of exercise a week. That's moderate exercise. That's about two and a half hours. If you do intense exercise, you can do less exercise. But in general, two and a half hours is the golden rule here. I know because of COVID-19, um, you have trouble exercising, go to your gym, but go out to nature, go out on the streets, go running, go work out at home. There's a lot of um, home exercise programs now. Go hiking um, in the forest and the national parks. I believe those are still open. So those really help. Um, interleukin-6 is an inflammatory marker that uh, we have seen that go up with many autoimmune diseases. And what studies have shown was that when you do exercise, uh, it increases interleukin-6 from your muscles. But we would think that's inflammatory. But what has shown is that when it comes from muscles, it's actually anti-inflammatory. So really, I really emphasize exercising. Any form of exercise is very good for you. If you can't run, if you can't hike, then stretch at home. There's, there's yoga, there's Pilates, anything is useful. So baby steps here, okay? Number three is sleep. You should be getting about seven to nine hours of sleep at night. When you don't sleep well, your inflammation can go up. So some of you have joint pains. So when you don't sleep well or you have insomnia the night before, you'll notice that your joint pains do get worse in the morning. That's because your inflammation goes up in the morning because of the lack of sleep. So I tell my patients, if you're not sleeping from nine to 10, I would recommend you decrease, uh, you, you take out things that can cause disruption to your sleep, such as a TV, a cell phone, try to avoid the computer or tablet an hour or two before you sleep so that you really focus on sleeping. You can read a book, you can meditate something. The bedroom is mainly for sleep. So try to take out distractions from the bedroom, okay? So number four and five, I'll come together. That's emotional well-being and healthy relationships. Stress is huge for lupus. So if you are having high stress, studies have shown that's correlated with more lupus flares. So you really wanna find ways to decrease your stress level, whether that's meditation, getting a therapist, uh, using guided imagery. Um, there's a lot of apps now online that can help you with the stress levels. I've had patients that have gone through a divorce, that have had a death in the family or abusive relationships. They tend to flare more after an incident. So I really urge you to um, really surround yourself with healthy relationships with people that build you up. That can really help with the lupus. And number six is tobacco and substance use. Really, if you're smoking or using illicit drugs, really uh, try to work with a health professional to really decrease the amount that you're using or eliminate it completely. I, I really think that if you stay away from these products, that you really will see your lupus start improving. Now, all these lifestyle medicine factors are very important. If you wanna have the chance of potentially improving your lupus and minimizing your medications, these six factors really have to be emphasized. Now, we're not all perfect. You're not gonna be perfect at this, but it's uh, baby steps. Eventually you'll get there and you'll do it very well. So I wanna say thank you very much, Lupus LA, for having me. I know it's about 10 minutes now. I wanna pass it on to the next speaker, uh, but any questions you can ask me on the Q&A. Thanks, Dr. Yu, I appreciate that. Uh, you've now eliminated my entire diet, so that's, exciting. <laughs> um, 
Next up, uh, we have uh, Dojo Aguilar. Dojo uh, is uh, the patient engagement liaison for GSK, one of our partners in crime. And uh, jo Dojo is a um, graduate of the Cebu Institute of Medicine College of Nursing, University of the Philippines, uh, and has had a 28 year nursing career starting in trauma nursing. So a lot of experience from Dojo and um, he always has really interesting things to say. And today, uh, as many of us are um, switching to a lot of telemedicine appointments, uh, Dojo is gonna give us some hints on how to prepare for a telemedicine appointment. Dojo, take it away. Thank you so much, Adam. And first of all, I just wanna thank Lupus LA uh, for uh, inviting me here to be part of this wonderful conference. And so for the next 10 minutes, I'm just gonna talk about uh, briefly uh, to help you prepare as a lupus patient, uh, how to have a successful telemedicine appointment with your physician. So telemedicine is basically um, you know, a simple uh, method by which we use electronic communications uh, to provide clinical services uh, for the physician to their patients when an in-office person visit is not possible. So as a lupus patient, these are probably some of the important things that you can ask your provider before you prepare for that appointment. So first of all, you want to make sure uh, what technology are you going to use uh, together with your physician? Um, you know, is it helpful for you to use a computer more than your cell phone? Because of the fact that, you know, with a computer, you have a bigger screen uh, rather than using your cell phone. Uh, make sure you also want to ask your physician, how long will this visit be? I think that's very important so that you can really prepare and be able to share with your physician important information about your lupus. Uh, you may also want to ask your physician if uh, uh, your insurance covers this telemedicine and uh, make sure also you want to ask your physician. Uh, there's a lot of mid-level practitioners now in a lot of uh, rheumatology practice, whether you're going to see your doctor actually a a nurse practitioner or physician assistant. So a lot of uh, medical groups now and rheumatology practices uses a uh, patient portal. So I think if you haven't had any telemedicine appointment yet, make sure to ask your physician whether you're gonna use their patient portal. And if you are gonna use that, uh, I think there's also very important things to bear in mind. Number one is uh, if you wanna actually share some important information to your physician ahead of your visit, for example, uh, you wanna share some pictures that maybe you took the last couple of weeks uh, about your rash, uh, you know, whether it's in your face or things like that. Uh, any maybe important questions that you have written down and you wanna um, email that to your physician ahead of your telemedicine appointment, I think that would be very helpful so that your physician will actually have the time uh, to review those questions ahead of your appointment. Um, and also, you know, ask your physician, you know, hey doctor, uh, can I connect with you through email or through the portal? If I have any questions out of this appointment or maybe two weeks from now, if I don't feel well, if my, my lupus flare is uh, uh, getting worse, uh, can I communicate with you? Or I've heard this from a lot of patients. Most of the time, if you have severe flares, you may end up in the emergency room. So make sure uh, to connect with your physician that if, if you end up in the emergency room, if you can tell the emergency room physician to contact your rheumatologist so that uh, the ER physician will better understand what you're going through. So here are some tips that I can uh, uh, share in terms of how you can prepare in advance, right, uh, for that uh, telemedicine appointment. I think number one, make sure that you have a very strong uh, uh, wireless connection in your home. Uh, ask your physician if uh, he or she wants you to use a webcam. I think that's very, very important also if you wanna show some uh, signs and symptoms that you are feeling with your lupus. And also consider maybe using a, a headphone, I think, uh, uh, sometimes we can experience some of these problems with uh, telemedicine with the audio connection. So on the day of appointment, uh, I would advise all of you as a patient to be ready with your computer, with your headset, at least 10 to 15 minutes uh, before your uh, appointment. Um, uh, make sure to ask your physician, you know, the, uh, who's going to call you or the exact number that they'll be calling from because, you know, there's I've heard this from patients, there's a lot of telemarketers right now. If you don't know exactly the number, you may not answer it. You might, you might miss a telemedicine appointment. Make sure you have your medication list with you. Uh, that's very, very important. 
Uh, also, is I would encourage you to write down specific questions that you may uh, want to ask your uh, uh, physician during that telemedicine appointment. And also, if you have done journaling, I think it's very important to have that journal uh, with you uh, during the appointment. Uh, make sure that you have those checklists and trackers so that you can really tell your physician some of those important symptoms that you have been feeling the last, since the last time you saw your uh, physician. Uh, so I think just, just like anything else, uh, make sure that you know, you're positioned in a, in, in a room that uh, your, your doctor can see you clearly, uh, have a pen and paper ready to take some, some notes uh, that is, uh, would be important for you uh, to take note. And um, so uh, uh, one of the things also that's very, very important in telemedicine is really um, uh, having an open and honest communication with your physician. So, I mean, that's even challenging to a lot of patients in office person visit, how much more in a virtual uh, telemedicine appointment. So one, one of the things I encourage my patients is really not just talk about your lupus symptoms or the flares you're having through, but also share with your healthcare team, with your physician, how is lupus really affecting your life? Those are such important information that your physician may wanna know uh, because these are things that you as a patient could, could easily overlook. That might be a sign of maybe uh, you know, early flare or maybe possible organ involvement, right? And this are thing because in lupus, there's two kinds of symptoms. One is clinical symptoms, which, you know, are the, the hair loss you experience, the oral ulcers, uh, some of those pain, but there's also subclinical symptoms, which are very hard to detect by the naked eye. And those subclinical symptoms may be an early sign of, let's say, an organ involvement. So that's very, very important to, uh, to really take note during a uh, virtual medicine appointment. And another thing is uh, if you, if any one of you here is a caregiver for someone living with lupus, um, really you are just as important as a patient, right? You are the second set of eyes and ears and hands to your loved ones living with lupus. So make sure you encourage uh, your loved ones to really seek for help, uh, you know, to use some of the resources. I mean, I know that Lupus LA has a lot of uh, resources available for you. Uh, and also here at GSK, we actually have a very uh, wonderful program called Us and Lupus, which uh, if you haven't been uh, exposed to that, uh, you can go to our Facebook page. We have a, a nice Us and Lupus uh, Facebook page, or you can go to our website, usandlupus.com, where you can actually download some uh, resources as well as sign up for this program. It's for free, and you actually get a lot of this wonderful resources like a lupus journal, a lupus checklist. You actually get a lupus dictionary and a lot of this lupus guidebooks, and this will be mailed to your house, uh, you know, uh, at least I think I a think couple weeks after you sign up. So in summary, uh, as a lupus patient, uh, always remember that you are not alone. And I thank Lupus LA. I know they've been very, very active in the community. They have a lot of support groups available for you. Uh, number two, make sure you maintain an open and honest communication with your healthcare team. Number three, really stay active in getting educated. And number four, uh, connect uh, with a lupus support group that's available through the Lupus LA uh, in the community. So again, thank you, uh, Adam, uh, for this time. And um, I'll be here for the Q&A. Excellent. Thanks, Jojo. That was really helpful. Um, next up, we have Elizabeth Prescott. I'm very excited about this as a uh, patient with lung and breathing issues and challenges. Um, I have not yet seen Elizabeth's presentation, but I hear it's really terrific. And she is an MDH certified breathing coordination practitioner and vocal consultant. I got all that out with one breath, I guess. So that's helpful. Uh, and she's the fourth practitioner in the world to be certified in the Martin and DeHaas breathing coordination uh, method. So and she's the only practitioner of that uh, in the United States. So we're really excited to have Elizabeth back and she's going to talk to us about how we can uh, improve our breathing and, and um, yeah, I'm excited to hear it. Welcome, Thanks. Elizabeth. Adam, I'm so happy to be here again, and uh, and I'm happy to report that since we uh, we were all last together uh, in 2016, we now have a handful of I would say five or six other practitioners in the U.S. We trained them right here, and so there are some a few other people around the country available, which is a, a nice resource. 
of course, we're doing it all on Zoom now anyway. So it, <laughs> it, ideally, it's a practice that we uh, do in person, but we can definitely, we've de developed protocols all around the world for doing this in this more remote way. We can certainly share the concepts. So uh, Great. first of all, thank you all for having me. And the, the big question for many of us is what, what is good breathing? Uh, and we certainly know that fight or, f fight or flight breathing is not ideal. That's not the most efficient thing. And unfortunately with, with lupus or anything that is scary or where we feel like we're not getting enough breath or just are experiencing anxiety, uh, we tend to go automatically to a fight or flight breathing, which involves locking the ribs in most cases. So it's kind of tight and uh, maybe lifting the sternum, especially if I've noticed uh, with uh, the first person with lupus with whom I worked, there was a tendency to really exaggerate the inhale in a fear that there wasn't going to be enough air but I wanted to share a, a metaphor I developed that I think most of us understand. If you think of the lungs, uh, if you think of this as uh, a parking structure and you've got all these uh, alveoli and they're parking spaces and they're only available if there isn't a car already parked in there. So if you have carbon dioxide or something else parked in that uh, alveola, when you're bringing oxygen and other gases in, you can circle that parking structure all you want and you're not going to find a space and you're just going to go right back out. And as the breather, if you've spent a lot of effort in pulling the air in, uh, working for your inhale and it's all circling and then going back out, of course, some of it's going to be absorbed. It's amazing how we can do breathe rather poorly and still get along just fine. But if you can manage to clear out the parking structure as much as possible, the inhale, first of all, you'll create a, a kind of a vacuum. So there's a negative atmospheric pressure on the inside. So much like the sea sponge, there's an elasticity that will draw the air in and it will distribute the oxygen so much more efficiently than what we could do if we're trying to pull it in in a forceful way. I use this and I checked it with my, my two uh, teachers and trainers in this were uh, Lynn Martin uh, who's in New York and is the functional anatomy x-ray vision guru lady who uh, uh, brought breathing coordination to us all. And then Robin de Haas uh, in Switzerland, uh, who's the, the singing and voice side of it, who then found her and created the training program. But I ran this by Lynn and she said, yes, this is very similar in consistency, uh, not when it's dry, but if it's a soft sea sponge in a bathtub, for example, it's, it's very elastic. So each Alveola has elasticity if it's healthy, and it will bring what it needs to itself. And it will, again, do it much more efficiently if you don't pull. So what we focus on in this practice is the exhale as much as possible. Now that doesn't mean exhale as far as you possibly can. We don't wanna to go to the point of discomfort or where you feel like you're squeezing. If you're squeezing, you're again using excess energy, you're wasting oxygen, and you're probably gonna kind of get the ribs in a configuration that's not ideal for the next inhale to happen well. So what we want the ribs to actually do, I'll try to kind of show you here, is not be lifted like a Halloween skeleton, but to hang freely and supplely, and we work on freedom in those intercostal muscles so that this can move well. And then on your exhale, this, if these represent my ribs, they're gonna do something like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. One, two, three, four, five. And they're gonna melt, so to speak, downward as they rotate downward towards the pelvis and towards your center. So that's the goal uh, in a nutshell. I mean, it's the, and I'm happy to help anyone figure out how to do this or get more specific. Of course, we can't get into a lot, lot of detail with that today, but you, and you see the, the shape of the, the rib where it attaches in the back to the vertebrae. It actually is, you can see it's designed, it's like a ball and socket, the shape of this and the shape of this for the ribs to rotate downward. So if you can think on your, rather than think, I need to breathe in, instead, sigh out a little bit and start counting gently, slowly, or you can use, we use a straw maybe to practice, 
a small, steady exhale that will calm your nervous system and become more, help you become more sensitive. Picture the ribs melting down towards the pelvis, even if you don't feel it. Imagine that you can. See if you can get someone to help you. You can work manually uh, uh, massaging on those intercostal muscles and uh, the, the scapulae, the, your shoulder blades, you wanna feel like they can move. Your legs should feel like they're free to move. Those long muscles of the legs have internal attachments that relate to the diaphragm. And the diaphragm itself is the one that we want to be moving this way on your exhale, 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 exhale. And then when you get to a comfortable level of, that's about as far as I can comfortably go, you just relax it. Of course, it's not coming up to your chin, but here we are. So it can come all the way up to about your fourth or fifth rib though. And that's what we're after. And I was very interested in uh, what you were saying, Dr. Yu, about the absorption, uh, about uh, nutrients and the gut. And I'd love to talk with you separately sometime about that. I have a hypothesis that when the diaphragm sits higher in general and isn't forced down too low on the inhale, so that there's much more room for all of those, I'm not a doctor, so I'll say all those downstairs organs. Anecdotally, we find that people, everything seems to move more freely. We get less reports of acid reflux. Um, just everything, I would think everything logically would move better and absorb better and eliminate better. And that's, those are the kind of reports we get, but I'd love to explore that with you. Um, yeah, now, in terms of the practice itself, when we, um, so we're, we're looking on the, uh, an easy long exhale and then a, a, a comfortable inhale. And the way we prepare for that is just to check for tensions throughout the body, as I mentioned. And there are little self-practice things that I can share with anyone who's interested. Um, and I think that was really uh, the main thing that I wanted to share with anyone, with everyone. I know I've got a few minutes left, but uh, there may be more questions and I'd rather be able to uh, answer those. Uh, the, I don't know if the straw exercise made sense. You're basically, if you have a small straw, you can pinch down a little bit and just blow a little. You don't wanna make a lot of force. You wanna get used to the comfort level of and picturing the ribs going down. And then uh, you can always add voice to that. And it, it should be very calming to the nervous system and also to the vocal cords. It's a very uh, efficient and calm way for them to work. Uh, now, um, I, I think there will probably be some questions uh, with regard to the current situation and masks and all that. So I wanna save some time for that. You took the words right out of my mouth, Elizabeth. We, we, um, I was going to actually start our Q&A um, with that question exactly, because I know some people are finding um, it really hard to breathe through masks, and certain masks seem to be more difficult. And um, what are your recommendations on masks? Yes, this is a very tricky thing, because for a mask to do the filtering that it needs to do, I mean, it's different when you just need a face covering. But when you need a mask, it's gonna be difficult to breathe through it. It just is. If it's not then, uh, or you know, more difficult, then it's not doing the filtering it needs to do. If you're breathing around the mask, it's not filtering the air. Uh, a colleague of mine, Crystal Barron, has uh, developed, has done a lot of looking into efficient, easy to breathe through fabrics. I, I can't speak in a lot of detail, but it was very exciting. We just spoke the other day. So a combination of layers of very fine silk and very fine cotton that, that seem to have the same uh, benefits as some of the medical grade masks, but they are easier to breathe through. They're not perfectly easy. But one of the important things that, that she and I were discussing is there needs to be a more active inhale, obviously, when you're wearing a mask, but we don't wanna go to the sternocostal breathing. I would say the best advice I could give is try to not do your exercising when you're wearing your mask try if you where you can avoid having to be exerting even walking uh, the walking is so important it's so important to get outside but if you can't do it in a way that's safe it's it's just going to be it's going to be uncomfortable and it can put you into kind of a fear response which is definitely not what we want for the nervous system but the intercostal muscles will have to be more active 
if you're breathing through that level of resistance. So you can practice the straw the other way. So I'm inhaling now and I'm trying to activate those intercostal muscles. And don't forget about your back. We tend to be just very front aware, but this is, you've got about 70% of your lung tissue is in the lower back part of the thorax. You know, you, your lung tissue, your, your heart takes up a lot of space here. You've only got about this much lung tissue up here and there's a lot of movement available in the back. So that's if we can, if any way you can find, whether it's yoga or Tai Chi or massage with someone who's in your family or whatever, you, whatever works for you to try to bring more freedom of movement into those back ribs and those back muscles that will really be helpful when you're actually trying to then breathe through that mask. And that leads me right into my next question for Dr. Yu, um, which came into us um, from one of our viewers here about acupuncture and Reiki and things of that nature. And um, how do you find that that helps with lupus and general auto inflammatory issues? Yeah, so uh, it's funny you asked that. Um, I actually just got accepted into the um, Integrated Medicine Fellowship in University of Arizona, and that's what I'll be learning in the next two years about Reiki, traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, what else is there? They learn about mind body medicine. So, I mean, I really, I, I grew up in a unique situation. My uncle was an acupuncturist in traditional Chinese medicine, my father was a Thai medicine doctor. So, I saw both sides. I do recommend acupuncture for pain. If you're having pain that's not resolved or you don't want to use medications, I would highly recommend acupuncture. Um, and also Reiki. I've looked up articles recently on Reiki and there's been articles out there in the Journal of uh, Complementary Medicine that Reiki does work. I mean, it, I don't think it'll work for everybody, but I think it's worth a try if you don't want to go on pain medicine. So I think everything is um, complementary. So of course, medicines is the mainstay, but you can work in different components. You try to minimize the medications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've done actually both of those things and they definitely have helped me. And, and it actually helps just even as a stress reliever, I think, um, from mm -hmm. my perspective. Um, Dr. Desai, so we have a question um, about lupus patients having higher risk of clotting um, because uh, with COVID-19, we already know that COVID-19, I guess, increases your risk of clotting and should lupus patients be more concerned about that? It's a great question. Whoever brought that up, that is a fabulous question. Uh, we have been seeing a lot of blood clots in patients with COVID-19. I don't think we have enough data as it relates to lupus. So right now, and I think it was another question that was on there, right now, a lot of the prominent lupus researchers across the country are going to be banding together and studying our 28,000 patients with lupus so we can kind of start seeing trends emerge. So we don't have specific data as it relates to lupus. But what I would say is if you're a patient with lupus and you know that you have antiphospholipid antibodies, um, and if you don't know if you have them, please ask your lupus physician and I'm sure they will let you know that if you have antibodies to antiphospholipid present, whether or not you've ever had a clot, you are already at higher risk of having blood clots and then I'm sure COVID would probably take that risk up higher if you contracted COVID. So unknown with all lupus patients across the board, but if you are a lupus patient and you know you have antiphospholipid antibodies, then I would uh, suggest that you already are at higher risk then of getting blood clots because of that. And if you had COVID, my guess is that would actually kind of tip you over more. Got it. Okay, great. Um, Dojo, so how do we, how do people worry, it, how do people react when they feel that a telemedicine appointment is going to be less than an in-person appointment? And is there, is there a way that some of the patients should look to make decisions about when they need to really go into an appointment versus when they feel it's okay to do a telemedicine appointment? You're muted there. Let me, yeah, perfect. Yeah, that's a great question, Adam. You know, uh, I think this is where it's very important as a patient to really work with your healthcare team, right? Um, knowing that, you know, you may not see your physicians now as often as you want and knowing that lupus flares, waxes, and, and wanes, right? And so I think that's what I mentioned earlier. 
uh, really ask your physician if there's any other way that you could connect with them, whether through the patient portal or through an email. Uh, lupus patients should not wait for the next appointment if they're not feeling well, okay? So that's why really the importance here, Adam, is really have a, an open and honest communication with healthcare team and make sure that as a lupus patient, you discuss topics that may, you may feel uncomfortable discussing with your physicians, right? These are important information that I believe will help your physician really better manage you as a lupus patient. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Yu, I'm, go ahead. Can I pick tail on that? Um, sure. Just to add, um, you know, so coming from the perspective of someone who's seeing patients on telehealth as well, I was amazed in March when we first had our lockdown in California and we had to shut down our clinics and convert everyone over to telehealth. I was amazed at how much I could actually do via the phone and then eventually via the video. I, I was amazed because I was completely anti telehealth. That being said, there were times that as I did a telephone interview or a video interview, when I was concerned, I asked the patient to come in the next week or the next day to be able to evaluate them further. So actually we can do a lot over the phone and through video. And then I would leave it up to your physician if there's enough that they're concerned about to actually bring you in. I was amazed by how much care we could actually deliver that way. I've heard that from a lot of physicians as well, that they are really surprised at how some that were very reluctant to do telehealth and, and they- Oh, completely. I mean, because as rheumatologists, we want to see our patients. We want to examine our patients. That's huge for us. So we naturally thought there's no way this is going to be a good enough fix, but it actually went really well. And right now, as things are ebbing and flowing, there are weeks my lupus clinic is open. Then there are weeks that I retract and I pull back and I call everybody instead because I'm a little too concerned about getting everyone together. So uh, have faith. It's actually pretty impressive what we can do with all of our um, advanced communication skills right now with the internet and the phone. And um, know that if there is something concerning, let your physician know and I'm sure they'll uh, bring you into clinic if they can. Great. Um, we got time for a few more. Dr. Yu, we're getting a bunch of questions on leaky gut and can a leaky gut be fixed and do probiotics um, help or hurt in terms of um, both the leaky gut and just general lupus diet? Yeah, so um, this is to go over what leaky gut is. It's basically um, the opening of the one cell line, opening up a little bit at, a, um, at the gut and that separates the uh, one cell line separates the immune system from the gut lumen. So can a leaky gut be fixed? Um, I think it can be improved. And I think that with diet and medications, it can be fixed. Um, but you really have to eat right when eating those things that I emphasize and avoiding the things that I emphasize as well. So the processed food, the high sugar, the high salt foods as well. And what was the second question, Adam? Uh, just about probiotics. Oh, probiotics. Yeah. So um, there's so many types of probiotics out there. Um, I would say it can't hurt, um, but I don't recommend that to my patients. I recommend natural foods to the fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. If you want to eat probiotics, by all means, um, but I don't think there's a standardized formula that is on the market that can say, oh, it can help with lupus specifically. So if you want to use it, I, I don't have anything against it. Got it. Okay. Uh, so here's a big topic, and I'll, I'll sort of leave this open to the group here, but um, kids going back to school and kids, at the kids with uh, parents who are lupus patients, um, you know, there, there's a lot of questions, at least, and certainly conversations going on in my house and houses uh, around the city about what are we supposed to do with our kids, you know, and how likely is it that a child might infect an autoimmune parent with COVID-19 and, and what are the implications of sending your kids to school or even doing smaller groups and pods and things of that nature. Maybe Dr. Desai, I'll start with you on, on that question. Sure, it's a great question. There's unfortunately been so much debate on it in the last you know several weeks um, and, and so many different um, recommendations kind of given across the country, across states, across cities, counties, that it is actually very confusing. First and foremost, I would be aware of what the risk of COVID is in your community. 
And you can do this by going online on Worldometer. You'd click on the country, you'd click on the state, and then you can click on the county. And that's important to know because depending on where you live, if coronavirus is quite rampant and there's a lot of cases and there's a high prevalence in your community, you might actually take a slightly different approach. Uh, for example, where we live in Orange County, LA County, schools are right now going to be online because of the sheer amounts of cases we have had, unfortunately, in our counties in California in the last several weeks. But that, of course, can change over time. So I want you guys to be aware of that. Now, if your schools are open and if there's a hybrid model where they're saying that people can actually come into schools um, and people can act like students can actually go. I would actually explore that further with the school. Find out are the teachers going to be masks, masked? Find out if the students are going to be mandatory masked. Find out how it's going to be in the classroom as well as outside the classroom. Lunchtime. How will lunchtime be? How will recess time be? There are so many questions you would want to ascertain to evaluate how safe is it for you to allow your child to go to school. I know there's huge benefits of our children actually being in school when it comes to learning, when it comes to so socialization, but I want everyone to understand what is going to be happening, hopefully will be for a short-term period of time over the next year. And we wanna make sure what you do is in the best interest for you and your student, your child as well, and what is the safest option. So there are a lot of things to look into and it will vary from school district to school district, county to county, state to state, what uh, measures they're actually taking in their school districts. And I would, I would implore you to go and ask the questions and find out what they're doing. My kids are 14 and 10, so they're a bit older. And I know this is different for younger age students versus older students, but they know that I work with lupus patients. I work with a high risk patient population because they are immunosuppressed. And my kids have already said, I'm not going back to school. Even if our schools open up, if there is an online option, my kids are old enough and with the resources we have, they are going to actually stay home the remainder of the year because they just don't trust other kids in their age range, in the hallways, you know, in the recess areas. And they don't know exactly how kids will um, take a lot of these rules, you know? So it, you, these are all great conversations that no one can make for you. But if you have the information and you know what's going on in your county, in your state and what the schools have available and what you have available at home and the ages of your kids, you can hopefully decide what's best for you. Excellent. Um, well, I think that's all the time we have today, but I just want to say a couple of things. First of all, thank you to all of you. This is really helpful information. I, there's about 30 questions we didn't get to, so you'll all be getting emails from uh, the panel, from the um, questionnaires. Um, so your inboxes um, are going to be full and we really appreciate you helping our patient population. And to all of the patients and their family members watching, remember that Catherine is going to email you a questionnaire um, and we really ap appreciate you filling out that questionnaire with as much information as possible. And then there is a space for you to ask your questions and we will get those answered for you. Um, you know, we're, we're really... Um, we thrive on interacting with our patient population and through Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, um, and through events like this, it's really important that we hear as much from our patient population as possible. Um, and whether or not we want to continue to do webinars like this or expand them or, or other things. And we're, we're going to be launching some uh, other really interesting things. We're going to do a, an online fundraiser soon to make up for what we've missed out on. And so, check your inboxes, follow us on Instagram and, and Twitter and Facebook. And um, thank you all for participating. Thanks to our panelists, our sponsors, and we hope everybody has a really wonderful uh, rest of your weekend and stay safe and stay healthy. Thanks very much. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye.